Hey, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is JC Cortez, and I'm the Director of Training and Development here at Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center. And we're so happy to have you here today to discuss an important topic on the coping to returning to in-person learning uh, in our schools, uh, understanding and helping how we can support our children cope throughout the pandemic and their return to school and all of those anxieties. There's so many pressures that exist around all of this right now. We have um, uh, learning loss and worrying about academics and coping with family loss and loss of life and understanding how to cope with that. So wrapping our heads around it is such an important topic and we want to be able to empower our parents more to understand how they can support their children throughout all of this, uh, who may not be able to understand and wrap their heads around it. I mean, so many of us still can't. So thank you for being here. Uh, one quick announcement, but let me just make an announcement for our Spanish speakers. Hola, buenos días. Si por si acaso necesitan de interpretación simultánea, estamos brindando ese servicio el día de hoy. Si usted necesita de eso, por favor, oprime el globito que está abajo al fondo de su pantalla, donde dice interpretación, y ahí usted podrá elegir ya escuchar la presentación traducido por nuestro intérprete, Rey Miranda. Si usted llega a tener algún problema con la interpretación, por favor, coloque esa información dentro de la charla para que podamos dirigirnos. Uh, sabemos que durante todo esto, esta tiempo, temporada de hasta hacer todo en las plataformas virtuales, este, a veces suceden problemas técnicos. Entonces, queremos dirigirnos a eso para asegurar que no tenga problema nadie. Gracias por estar aquí. So, good morning. Yes, my name is JC Cortez, the Director of Training and Development at Synergia. Synergia has been helping families and supporting families with disabilities for over 40 years. We're based in East Harlem and we've been working across the city, across the five boroughs, um, you name it. So we support them in a number of ways. And that would be, you know, it's, it's a multi-service agency. So we're always doing things with housing, things with uh, special education advocacy and supporting families, primarily whose uh, language is not English or who find themselves, uh, they themselves with special training needs. We also help, help them participate more effectively in their children's education and development. And we partner with professionals and policymakers to improve outcomes for all children with disabilities, as we have today. Uh, Synergias, which is Spanish for Synergy, is one of New York City's three federally funded parent centers committed to serving people with disabilities and their families with an added focus on communities of color and the economically disadvantaged. Synergia creates innovative programs ranging from transitional housing for homeless families who have children with disabilities, an integrated transition program for adolescents with autism and de developmental disabilities, uh, and also after school art classes that we do in partnership with the Guggenheim, um, and also uh, parenting and education advocacy training for parents with children with disabilities. So thank you so much for being here. A warm welcome to all of you joining us on Facebook. Thank you so much. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, for those of you on Facebook joining us, uh, please, Place your questions or comments in the comment section. And for those of us joining us here today via Zoom, thank you so much. Uh, you will receive a link to the recording of this video in case you have to duck out early. You'll also receive a copy of the PowerPoint, which will be available. Uh, it is in English and Spanish, so we're happy to uh, uh, provide that. Also, if you have any questions at any specific time, uh, please make, place them in the comments. Uh, the, comment section in the chats, chat box or in the Q&A box. Either one is fine. Um, ask them as we're going through. Don't feel, don't feel like you're interrupting the flow. Honestly, uh, I find it better to ask the question when I'm in the, you know, in my deep in my thoughts right then, because if we wait until the end, then I've kind of lost my train of thought by then uh, seeing other information go by. So feel, please feel free. We hope you have a better understanding of everything. We understand that we won't have a full understanding, but we'll have a better understanding. And that's the goal of it all. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to take the steps to understand this and, and to help support your young ones uh, in a better capacity. So thank you so much. I do ask that if you do have a, a specific, a case specific question to just please remember you are on a public forum. Uh, this is being recorded. So if it's really case specific, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, we wouldn't want you oversharing in a public forum. Uh, so yes, please take that into account. Uh, so thank you for joining us on our presentation on coping with the return to in-person learning. And we're delighted to be joined today by our partners, Gabriela Munoz de Subiria and Maria Sol Añosa, uh, both of Fordham University. And we're happy to have both of you today. Welcome back, Gabi, and welcome, Maria Sol. 
Uh, a few uh, in brief information on both of them. Gabriela Munoz is, uh, this video is a fourth year counseling psychology PhD student at Fordham. She was born in Chile to Colombian and Peruvian parents and lived in Venezuela prior to moving to the United States. Her clinical interests include working with historically marginalized and underserved populations. Specifically, she is interested in counseling undocumented immigrants and individuals from mixed status families. She has clinical experience working in two distinct college counseling centers, providing short-term individual psychotherapy to young adults. Her identity as a Latina immigrant has strongly influenced her educational research and career trajectories. As a member of the CCMH project at Fordham University, she seeks to expand her clinical experience working at, with at-risk children, uh, school-aged children and their families. So welcome, Gabi. And Maria Sol Añosa is a second year doctoral student in the school psychology program at Fordham University. Her desire to pursue this career was confirmed when she discovered that there is a major scarcity of bilingual psychologists in educational settings. In 2020, she graduated from the University of Connecticut with a bachelor's degree in psychology and human development and family sciences. As a Peruvian immigrant, go Peru, uh, she is interested in researching the experiences of undocumented immigrant students and their families in US public school systems. Using qualitative research, she seeks to amplify their voices and further understand how to assist them through the ac uh, academic and socio-emotional supports. As a member of the CCMH project at Fordham University, Maria Sol aspires to learn more about how the intersectionality of a client's social identities, such as race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera, may combine to create unique modes of discrimination. She hopes as a fluent Spanish speaker, she can help to enhance the family clinician club collaboration. So welcome ladies, thank you so much for joining us. And please, um, as I was saying at the beginning, this presentation is so important. We've heard of so much and we've heard of so many social anxieties uh, within children and not knowing how to cope. Uh, you know, they have to learn to, they have to be in school and they're trying to catch up on everything. They're worried about getting COVID and what it is and not understanding what it is. And then we've heard cases of bullying students who suddenly disappear for 10 days for quarantine, even though it's confidential, you know, when somebody goes missing for 10 days, we kind of know what's going on. And then when they return, they suffer bullying and it doesn't add anything of value to their load already. So there's so many things going on in this and, and please, uh, I'll be quiet so you can please and, and uh, share more with us on this topic. Thank you so much, JC. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and Maria so will start us off. Okay, is that clear for everybody? Looks good. Okay, great. So, well, thank you, JC, um, Synergia, and thank you to all the parents for joining us today. So like JC already mentioned, we'll be presenting on how to cope with the transition back to school after families have gotten um, accustomed to remote learning. So at the end of the presentation, we'll leave a few minutes to answer questions and maybe engage in a conversation. Um, and yes, so we're part of the CCMH program, which stands for Clinical Mental Health Services in the Bronx Community. And we offer free mental health counseling sessions to students ages eight through 16. And um, before we begin, I'd just like to mention that I know that many of you will probably relate to a lot of the topics we're gonna mention. So if you have a personal situation you think you need advice on, I would encourage you to attend our consultation sessions with our counselors that are trained on various mental health topics and you can also email CCMH and request a counselor to call you. And we'll leave our contact information for JC um, to distribute to everyone. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction, Maria Sol. Um, I wanna reiterate one more thing and that we welcome questions. We, we welcome comments um, as they come. You can use the chat or speak up and once we hear you, we'll, we'll stop talking and, and attend to that. Um, but again, like JC mentioned, if something um, is very personal because we are um, being recorded and this is a public platform, to just be mindful of that. Um, but now I'm gonna share our agenda for the day. So we'll begin uh, by talking about how COVID has impacted us. We'll then move on to mention the signs of stress that you and your child may be experiencing. 
We'll touch upon how to prepare for back to school success, how to help your child cope, and we will bring up some tips about how to ease you and your child's anxiety. Lastly, we'll go over some back to school skills to teach that are related to COVID regulations and some important things that parents should know if they have children receiving special education services or if they are English language learners. Okay, so around the world, everyone has been impacted in some way by the COVID pandemic. And whether you lost a job, a loved one, or simply the comforts of your normal life, the past year will definitely have a lasting impact on all of us. And coronavirus cases are often relatively mild for young people under the age of 18, but that doesn't necessarily mean children and adolescents aren't feeling the effects of living through a global pandemic. Um, since their education, family life, um, recreational activities, social interactions, and daily routines have been turned upside down during a time in their lives that should be carefree and full of optimism. So how is COVID impacting kids? First, we have uh, disruptions in learning. So schools adopted a hybrid learning model throughout the past year with a combination of virtual and in-person instruction. Um, additionally, students and teachers were required to quarantine when exposed to COVID-19. And while necessary, these disruptions could have a lasting impact on their academic and emotional well-being. And while teachers and parents did their best to adapt and accommodate, many kids didn't retain information as well in the modified classroom settings, which could lead to difficulty absorbing curriculum even after returning to normal. And we also know that students have had to experience changes in their routines. And having a predictable routine is really important for kids as they develop. So as parents, you can all probably agree that routines went out the window during lockdowns and school closures. And while all of these situations were unavoidable, um, departing from students' normal routine likely caused feelings of stress and isolation. And with social distancing measures, kids are also stuck at home, isolated from their relatives and friends, and they may not have access to extracurricular activities that once brought them joy. Um, and like the rest of us, kids are adjusting to a new normal and may experience feelings of sadness, isolation, and anxiety. Also, prior to COVID, significant life events like birthdays and holidays were often taken for granted. And while adults are feeling the loss of these special moments, it's important to acknowledge that our kids are grieving the loss of these experiences as well. So missing significant life events is a stressor. We really need to recognize that students are also experiencing. And lastly, the pandemic resulted in job loss, evictions, and loss of security for millions around the US and also around the world. Um, now, with all of that being said, this um, signs of stress in your child, here we'll go over some of that. So we know that many of the circumstances um, are outside of our control, but it's still important to talk to children about COVID-19, uh, to recognize signs of stress and provide support um, when necessary to your children. So the following are some signs of stress that you can look out for in young children. We'll go over um, for, for older children as well. So fussiness and irritability, changes in sleep, feeding issues, um, GI issues, separation anxiety, hitting, biting, or having frequent tantrums, wetting the bed after being potty trained or regressions of that kind. So many children are gonna display some difficulty separating from parents to attend school, but when you see tantrums when separating, problems sleeping alone or refusing to attend activities without the parents, this can suggest um, the need to require some more intervention. Um, in the same way, shyness or worrying about schedules, schoolwork or friends is natural during the transition, but an ongoing withdrawal or an ongoing worry may signal um, again that more intervention is necessary. And this intervention could be talking to um, the pediatrician or primary care doctor and finding um, a referral for, for um, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. 
Once again, though, I want to reiterate that it is normal for nearly all children to experience some mild back to school jitters that gradually diminish over a few weeks. So again, the focus on these, if these things are not stopping and they are persisting. Okay, so now these are signs you all can look out for if you have older children and adolescents. So we have changes in mood, like irritability, hopelessness, rage, or frequent conflicts with others, changes in behavior or lack of interest in personal relationships, loss of interest in normal activities or schoolwork, trouble sleeping, changes in weight, eating habits, or personal hygiene, difficulty concentrating or remembering things, um, we also have an increase in risky behaviors and thoughts about death or suicide. And if your child is experiencing this, it's very important to get them in contact with a mental health specialist. Um, so be sure to call 911 in an emergency. And also the NYC Well hotline is also a great source to contact where a trained counselor or peer support specialist will listen to your concerns or help you through a crisis. Okay, and I just before moving on want to see that there was a question about our services and yes, we will go over this um, all that information at the end of the presentation. Okay, so talking about parental stress so each fall parents and guardians caregivers they're tasked with managing back to school transitions. Usually this means shopping for school supplies or clothing and shoes, regi registering for sports or after school activities and developing a schedule for um, their children in this uh, a routine again. But with COVID-19, the, the start of the school year can feel very different um, in terms of you know, being nervous or frustrated, etc. So in this time of COVID, parents and guardians and uh, caregivers and children are experiencing higher levels of anxiety and stress. They may feel nervous about um, getting COVID-19 or spreading COVID-19 at school, um, you know, when we hear about new variants and just kind of learning to, uh, to cope with the coronavirus um, the feeling of nervousness is one that comes up a lot. Parents, uh, caregivers, and children may also feel frustrated by vague reopening plans. So, um, you know, I know that we're in almost December now, but thinking back to August or September, not being sure what exactly the schedule was going to be like, completely in person, remote, hybrid, et cetera. And, th and that vagueness um, can make some people feel frustrated. And, and that is, that's, that's okay. They may also feel skeptical of whether children are able to follow the social distancing and mass protocols. So especially with um, younger children or even uh, adolescents or teens, do they want to wear the mask? Are they fully understanding um, the need to wear a mask? Are they, you know, actually distancing at school or, or what goes on once they enter the school? Um, I think these are all valid questions and things that come up for parents. Okay, so how can we help the situation and prepare for back to school success? Firstly, it's good to plan ahead. So the more you plan ahead as a family, the more it can alleviate any worries your child may have and instead equip them with the tools they need to feel confident through the transition forward. And if you're aware of the school's safety precautions, you can review them together um, so there aren't any surprises when your child first goes to school. And if you have a higher risk family member or any family members that you're concerned about, you can explain what that means for your child and the extra precautions that might entail compared to what their friends might need to do regarding the mask protocols or any safety precautions. Secondly, it's good to talk about our worries. So you can have a family meeting where you talk to your children about their worries, their fears, or even their excitement. And you can give them a safe space to kind of synthesize their thoughts, um, hone awareness of their own feelings and share what's on their mind. So they're not holding it all in. It's really good to have family meetings um, where everyone's 
kind of just saying what they feel and everyone's able to take everything in. It's also important to anticipate some anxiety and nerves. So being around people, again, like Gabby said, comes with a lot of anxiety or nerves for students who have been worried about getting sick. So if you're able to anticipate these nerves, you can come up with some ways to cope with them when they do arise. And practicing reframing negative thoughts as more positive ones can be helpful to do in advance. Um, and if your child says they're worried that they're going to get sick, which happens a lot, a lot of kids are experiencing a lot of anxiety about this if they're just coming back to school. Um, so practicing more positive self-talk that counters the worry um, you can can be really helpful. You can try to help them kind of say things like, so I know I'm worried I'll get sick, but I also know I'll be wearing a mask and keeping distance from other kids. So really I'm doing what I need to keep myself healthy and practicing those positive self affirmations can really help when, you know, you as their parent isn't going to necessarily be them, be there at the school with them. It's just really important to practice those positive thoughts. Um, so it's also necessary to proactively check in about mental health. And the pandemic was a collective trauma, and we don't yet know the impact that it's going to have long term. But we do know that rates of anxiety and depression have been soaring in kids and teens as their usual structure and coping mechanisms um, have been completely changed. And for many, even basic needs like food security have been ripped out from under them by the pandemic. So parents should really plan to proactively check in about their child's mental health, even if it has never before come up as a concern. So you can look for signs and symptoms that something is wrong, like the, the ones we previously mentioned, like isolation, irritability, low mood, lack of uh, motivation or concerns about safety. And I'd also recommend having a very low threshold for getting professional help. So when in doubt, like Gabby already said, you can ask your pediatrician. You can also go to a therapist, school counselor, or psychiatrist for an evaluation to see if there is something that needs treatment or just for some reassurance that what your child is experiencing is a normal reaction to the current stressor, which is a big one you know, the pandemic. Um, we also shouldn't expect everything to change overnight. So everyone's routines look different from how they did before. Sleep cycles are off, commutes will have to come back and meal times might shift as well. So um, practically all routines may have to change to adapt back, adapt back to in-person school. So the best thing you and your child can do is to set realistic expectations and anticipate that getting into a new and stable groove will take some time. Um, it's necessary to stay flexible and adaptable. So maybe an adverse event at the school leads to a closure again, or cases in your local community arise causing concern. So try to stay mentally flexible and ready to adapt. Parents can communicate with school to stay on top of what the latest is and brainstorm together with a school representative, like a counselor, or how to best um, just to go over how to best support your kid, given the changing circumstances. And lastly, kids need stability during times of change. So try your best to be present, predictable, and consistent. If your child's reactions seem a bit different than normal, perhaps more irritable, the best thing you can do is meet their reactions with compassion, warmth, and calm instead of reacting yourself. Um, and if you've channel a peaceful energy, you'll likely um, be able to share that with your kids when they need it the most. Definitely. And um, these are some more in-depth ways to help your child cope while transitioning back. Uh, so one of the first things that goes along with what Maria Sol was saying in, in meeting your child with compassion um, is also having honest and open discussions. So there's a phrase that's used in psychology, which is what you resist persists. Um, and this describes how avoiding important discussions can actually lead to more persistent feelings of anxiety in children. For example, you know, 
that avoidance is only like reinforcing perhaps the thoughts of what is going on, why is no one talking to me about this, um, whatever the child is feeling, right, in the sense of cloudiness or, or just not really being aware of what's going on. And we have to remember that, you know, they're in school where they're receiving information, they might hear the news um, and helping them interpret what is going on without instilling, you know, a, a greater fear. So, it's important to have honest, factual, and open conversations with your child about COVID-19 and its implications for returning to school or what they are doing if they're already at school and they're not in a hybrid or fully virtual model. So tailor the depth and breadth of conversations based on the child's age and maturity level. So for example, with a younger child, perhaps grade one to three, um, I believe this is ages six or seven to maybe nine, um, maybe 10, you can spend some time talking about what might look different this year. So their class size may be smaller um, and teachers and educators are wearing masks. I've heard in even some cases, the class may even get bigger if there are maybe less teachers. Um, so just keeping in mind either alternative. Some extracurricular activities or regular school activities might be canceled. Um, so taking a moment to talk through all of that with your child and, um, and the student, helping them understand that these changes, you know, why they're happening, it's all to keep them safe. For older children, um, you could ask if there are specific things that they're worried about or concerned about and talk uh, through those things with them having a sit down conversation here and there to ask about their worries really can go a long way. Um, letting them know, you know, you're also, you're also there to help and they're not expected to have it all figured out just because they're a little bit older. And you can help children and youth identify their role in staying safe. We'll go over all of this more in depth as well later, but again, you know, avoid touching their face, washing their hands often, using hand sanitizer if they're not able to wash their hands with soap and water, keeping a safe distance from others, um, using coping focused language that emphasizes the active role that children, youth, and adults are taking to make sure that things go well, not just for themselves, but for others. We're, we're in this together and um, kind of this, this fight against COVID and the coronavirus is a, a team effort. It doesn't really work if we're not all in it. So these following instructions, engaging in good hygiene, um, and this takes the focus off the things that are out of our control. For example, if uh, the student or child does happen to get COVID-19, um, which is a possibility. Gabby, I wanna ask you a question we have on here. Um, how can we help a child who is returning to trust to First of all, let me rephrase that. How can we help a child who's returning to in-person trust school staff? For example, the question here from one of our uh, parents here is, my son is learning to adjust and kind of is relearning how to get help when, he faced, when he's faced with difficult situations with other kids. He, however, feels he can't trust the adults at the school. Is this normal? Hmm. What a great question and feeling like you can't trust the adults in the school. That's definitely very hard. And I wonder if perhaps a parent or caregiver can work together with the child to reestablish that trust. So for example, the parent or caregiver is an adult that maybe is similar to the individual at the school, the teacher that the child is, is relearning that trust with them. So having another adult with them and establishing kind of that retrust and bringing, bringing them together in those conversations, sharing questions and curiosity of what might, might be going on. Is it that, you know, the child has gone to the teacher for help and support and have been met with um, a lack of support in that sense um, or what exactly, it, right? Each specific situation. Um, but I think if the child is struggling um, in relearning that trust with the teacher at school, is having a, a parent also model that trust. 
with them when they go in and, and share those concerns to the teacher. Great, maybe even like a parent teacher student meeting or something, you know, to kind of definitely talk it out uh, and maybe talk to the school psychologist or counselor too. Um, we do have another question that was sent in the uh, pre-registration questions. And this is, uh, what are some things that parents can do to support children who have lost a family member and don't want to return to school? For example, my daughter was seven when she lost her papa, her grandpa, and we were both very close to him. Yeah, in those situations with grief and losing someone during this time and having the response of not wanting to go back to school, um, it would be very helpful in that situation to have the child, have someone to talk to if they're not already seeking mental health counseling, perhaps a psychologist or another counselor, um, because not wanting to go back to school can stem from the grief or from something else, but allowing the child to have a space to talk about those things um, with a professional would be, I think, most important. Grief is, is very complicated, especially during this time and at such a young age. Thank you. Um, as well, I was thinking um, it's also helpful. Sometimes a lot of mental health providers offer groups where children can kind of get together with, with other students that are having similar worries and just talk through. Sometimes talking to someone that is a similar age as you can, um, you know, help students feel like they're not alone in what they're feeling. Um, at CCMH, we do have a um, group that's going on right now. It's mainly just to socialize and talk about some, um, you know, COVID related worries. Um, so if, you know, any parent needs information on that, we can also um, um, give you all that information. Maria Sol, thank you for bringing up the groups. Um, JC will send you an additional resource for grief groups um, that's outside of CCMH, but that we have often worked with individuals in individual therapy and then receiving group um, with an outside organization that we find to be very helpful. That would be great, yes, and I'll be sure to send it in the follow-up email that will include a link to this recording and a copy of the PowerPoint. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, so, um, to help students cope with their worries, we it's important to begin by naming the fears to tame those fears. So as child psychologists or psychologists in training like Abby and I, we often encourage parents to use the name it to tame it strategy. So first, parents can help their child identify their concerns by asking them what they're worried about. Then they can help their child name the worry or concern by labeling it. So for example, younger children might name their fear the worry monster. And simply labeling this emotion as anxiety can be helpful for um, older children and teenagers as well. Um, and naming the worry often helps tame the fear by helping children build understanding about what they're feeling. Uh, it also gives parents and the, and children a common emotion language that can be used in future discussions and provides an opportunity for parents to provide emotional support and coping strategies. And these strategies include deep breathing and using coping focused language like I feel better when I talk about my worries and things like that. Um, going back to that positive self talk, which is really important and children often want reassurance that their fears won't come true. So it may be tempting for parents to say, everything's gonna be okay, or no one's gonna get sick, don't worry. But those words can actually prevent children from facing their fears and developing problem solving and coping skills. So um, it's important to just talk about those fears because not doing so can prevent, can also prevent children from taking COVID preventative measures like social distancing, um, take kind of not follow those rules because they're like oh my 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 mom my dad they're saying that I'm not going to get sick so um I don't have to take this seriously I don't have to take putting my mask on so seriously um 
so yeah, so it's just important to acknowledge and support your child in the discomfort that there are things that may be out of con our control, but it's just best to focus on we can on what we can control and just having those discussions that can be difficult but important to have. Okay, and continuing with how to help your child cope again with the related to the question that JC had asked earlier, but we need to listen and validate and help problem solve. So when your child expresses or demonstrates that they're struggling, start by listening carefully to their concern. Um, by listening carefully and, and being really there with your child, we think of putting our devices away like a laptop, a cell phone, an iPad, et cetera, and giving your child the undivided attention and say, you know, I'm here to listen to your concern. And this works um, or is useful, I should say, for anything not just related to COVID. Um, then you can validate your child's emotion um, and you can make a caring statement that reflects what they have just said. So I can understand why you feel worried about returning to school, especially when there are so many changes happening because of COVID-19. Or in the case of um, feeling like it's difficult to trust the adults at school, I can understand that you're having some difficulties trusting for X, Y, Z reason, whatever they may have mentioned to you. And, um, and reflecting back what they've said to you, making sure that you're on the same page about what they're sharing. So identifying reasons why your child might be feeling worried or anxious will make them feel more understood. And it's important to acknowledge children's worries and anxieties, but parents should also motivate their children to focus on the things that they might be looking forward to. So children are likely excited to see friends, peers, or even teachers in person and um, they may positively anticipate a daily school routine and take pride in their role as a student or in minimizing COVID related risks. Before school starts, you can ask, what are you looking forward to on your first day of school? Or what have you missed about school? And um, once school starts, which is where we're at now, you can ask, what was the best thing that happened today? And learning about their day and what's going on um, at school. Yes, and another way uh, parents can help their children build feelings of safety and security during this pandemic is by creating a predictable daily routine, beginning with consistent times for meals, waking up, and going to bed. So before or after school, you can engage your child in planned shared activities like making breakfast together, reading together, or going to the park. Um, it's also important to model calm behavior and so as parents modeling confident attitudes about returning to school for your child um, is really important. You can use cheerful, positive messages when saying goodbye and empathy when responding to tantrums, protests, or crying, which will likely happen a lot more often now. So it's even more important to just be very empathetic with your children. Um, research also suggests that children notice how their parents feel and pick up on subtle cues like scared facial expressions or cautious tones of voice. So parents who care for their own well-being and mental health are better able to care for their children's. It's really necessary for you all as parents to be kind to yourselves and seek out those you can turn to when you're struggling or troubled by these unprecedented circumstances. Um, so be sure to seek mental health services if you're feeling overwhelmed or if you just feel like you need to vent. It's really important to do this. All right, and along those lines, here are some five tips to ease your child's back to school anxiety. So some of the strategies we will mention are especially helpful for children with autism spectrum disorder or um, other children that can benefit from these strategies. So a week or two before school, which again, I know that we are in almost December, but we can apply this to um, January once we're out of break of the December, um, the December break. So a week or two before school, start preparing children for the upcoming transition by getting 
um, back to school routines, such as setting a realistic bedtime and um, you know, setting out tomorrow's clothes. You can arrange play dates with one or more familiar peers before school starts. Research shows that the presence of a familiar peer or friend during school transitions can improve children's academic and emotional judgment. You can visit the school and rehearse the drop off and spend time on the playground or even inside the classroom if the building is open and you're allowed. So having the child practice walking into class while you wait outside or down the hall can be really helpful. And for those with younger kids, um, you can come up with a prize or a reward um, that the child can earn for um, having that successful uh, school attendance and being able to, um, to have that separation from the parent or the caregiver. And prior to school starting, you can get a thermometer and explain what it does. For example, if temperatures are being taken at school, getting used to doing this at home, for example, can ease the transition to being in that environment that perhaps feels sort of medical, right? When the student's like, I'm, I'm not at the doctor's, I'm at school, why is my temperature being taken, right? So doing those activities at home can be helpful in that transition. Okay, so figuring out how to manage anxiety and tolerate uncertainty are important skills for everyone. But for parents, they're even more essential, especially during these times. So I would say try to focus on what you can control. The anxiety around what will happen with school is so high that we really just have to try to set a frame that flexibility is our new thing. And the situation is probably going to change. Kids may go back and forth between remote and in-person learning, but we're all doing the best we can and we have to accept that. So avoid catastrophic thinking by talking yourself down from worst case scenarios. You can also, um, really try to maintain social connections. So in times of extreme stress, people who have solid su social support are less likely to feel traumatized and overwhelmed. So even though you're, you know, I know your main priority are your kids at this time, it's important to reach out to close friends who will listen and support you, as well as people who can make you laugh and take your mind off of things. And be transparent about ground rules. So if you want to provide your family with more social exposure, but are worried about getting together in person because the other family may not have the same opinion on social distancing or masks that, um, you, maybe you could say something like, hey, we really wanna see you. And this is what we're thinking. What are your thoughts? So practice setting boundaries, even when it feels uncomfortable. Um, for example, if friends aren't practicing the same level of caution, um, explain that you won't be able to see them until you feel confident there's no risk of infection. And along these lines, if somebody gets too close when you're outside, it's totally okay to politely ask them to step back um, and consider it all of this. You, it's important to consider that this is kind of the new social norm that we all have to continue to get used to this and things may not go back to normal um, as they previously were. Um, it's also important to take breaks when you need them. Untreated anxiety can make you feel irritable and overwhelmed. If your child is constantly asking you questions during the middle of an important work assignment or at the end of a long day, you may find yourself snapping at them. So it can help to take a step back and breathe before responding. Uh, but you can explain to them that you're overwhelmed and you need to take some deep breaths, complete your work or relax before you can help them. You can assure them that, you know, it, this isn't their fault because by doing that, um, not only will you feel sh less stressed, but you'll also be modeling the right way to manage anxiety. And um, explain your feelings to others. And if you did yell at your kids, perhaps don't worry. It happens to everyone. Um, instead, just try to model how to repair the problem. You can do this by telling your child how you were feeling and explaining what you think you should have done instead. Like I should have taken deep breaths before, um, lashing out on you and emphasize that you're sorry. 
also, like I mentioned before, don't hesitate to seek help. I know that this is a very stressful time for everyone, but it doesn't mean that you don't need help if you're struggling. Um, so if you've tried informal strategies and they're not working, it may help to seek a professional. Many are seeing patients through either telehealth or in-person sessions with precautions. So really, if you, tr if you think you need it, I would suggest that you can look um, or even talk to one of us about um, who you can reach out to during these times. Definitely. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over four skills that students can learn to use across the school day. And these are so important because these skills do not just apply to our response to COVID, but in general, they're helpful in keeping hygiene and staying healthy year round. Um, so yeah, personal hygiene, good tips. First, um, learning how to wash your hands. This came about when we you know, were first, um, what was it now, maybe like 18 months ago, um, learning that we scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. And it's important to teach students to wash all parts of their hands. So um, their thumb, the top of the hand, the palm, underneath the fingernails, et cetera. And we'll have more information on all of this, but also um, to not touch uh, certain uh, things or other people or your face or your mouth, et cetera, in helping prevent the spread of COVID. Um, if you're, you know, sharing keyboards, it helps to maybe take a, um, a little wipe to clean that, you know, before you hop on it. Um, and that's a good strategy, strategy to use year round. Also properly wearing a mask. I know if you take the subway, you often see um, the cartoon face with a mask covering the mouth and the nose, and that's the correct way to wear it. Um, and, and not having the nose out or the mouth out, um, or proper ways of wearing a mask. Also, um, proper social distancing. Um, so I, you know, being indoors now and with vaccinations, um, but it's also remember, important to remember that not all children you know, have been vaccinated or can get vaccinated depending on their age, et cetera. So still keeping in mind the, um, the, the physical distancing uh, when indoor. And again, what Maria Sol was saying with, um, you know, setting those boundaries with other people, maybe that's having like the distance of a hula hoop around you um, or these like informal uh, measurements um, such as your hands stretch from side to side is the distance that people should kind of physically separate from you. Okay, so, um, oops, okay. So <laughs> now we're gonna talk about um, some things that may be important to know for parents that have children with special needs. Um, so, Children with individualized education plans, IEPs, might have lost some skills previously gained. So it's essential for educators to know how their students' educational needs have changed. So parents need to communicate with their teachers um, about any changes that you know are important for them to know so that they can best help um, their, your child accommodate to these new circumstances. Um, and as parents, you can also communicate with school districts to talk about how your child's IEP um, might need to be adjusted. If, if you haven't, you know, there's a lot of new changes because of the pandemic. Maybe your child is experiencing some new um, social emotional um, challenges. And even those are really important to communicate to their teachers especially if they're, um, if they have an IEP. Um, so for ELLs, English language learners, the DOE has posted support and resources for multilingual learners and English ling language learners on their website, which is linked to this PowerPoint if you all wanna um, take a look through there. And this is important to remember um, 
parents of students with disabilities in New York City schools who are limited English proficient are entitled to translation and interpretation services. So, you know, you at, if your first language is in English and you, you are in contact with your um, schools regarding your child's education plan, it's important for you to um, make use of these services um, to best help your child. Yes, and um, that link we have here, but in the interest of time and letting some questions, this will be sent out to everyone on the PowerPoint, so I'm not going to click on it, but it includes resources. We have it in both English and Spanish, but, um, you know, we want to thank everybody so much for your time today, and and if there's, you know, any questions that, that we have a couple of minutes left for, we're happy to answer them and also uh, talk about the services at CCMH, um, if that is that if that is the question that I saw one in the chat wondering if we are virtual and we are everything that CCMH does is is virtual. Can you just share what CCMH actually stands for, uh, for those that are unfamiliar with the acronym? Absolutely. Yeah, so it stands for um, clinical mental health services. Um, Actually, this was a funny question um, before I, I was also asked what the second C in CCMH is. So Gabby, do you know by any chance? Yeah, so it's the Mother Cabrini Health Foundation. Okay. Uh, there we go, okay. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. I, I think you covered a lot of concerns here. I really appreciated the fact that you are talking about parents, you're addressing parents' anxiety and how to address their own fears. Uh, I think that's so important important. It's kind of like the uh, the mask on an airplane scenario, you know, first put your own mask on before you try to help somebody else. And I think that's the same situation. We have to remember us as caregivers, we have to take care of ourselves first and make sure that we're okay in order to better offer support to others, including our children. So I think that's really great. Also, the whole piece that you included about you know speaking your concerns and speaking your fears and, and that whole thing for an adult, I think for, as often as parents, we forget that we're big advocates for everybody else. And sometimes we forget to advocate for ourselves. Um, and it's one thing that we always try and reiterate here at the Parent Center is always just, you know, advocating for your child and teaching your child self-advocacy skills. But we also have to remember, and I'm guilty of this too, of not advocating for myself in certain situations. It's like, whoa, hey, I could have said something. So if you need help, seek help. There's plenty of help in New York City Well the CCMH here at Fordham University, uh, the other resource that Gabby's gonna share with us that I'll share with you via email. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, as for parents sharing with the IEP team, um, if you notice any significant changes in your child's behavior or child's patterns of learning or anything that you feel of a concern, you are always encouraged to uh, mention that and share that with your child's IEP team. Um, so that they can, you know, address that better. Um, and if it's something that you can't necessarily describe and maybe you're observing it, you're always welcome to make a recording and share that. A lot of people forget that, uh, that ability. So uh, if that's something that is of concern to you, you can always do that. Um, but yes, uh, we have a comment here. Excellent presentation. Lots of great tips for children and families. Very clear and simple enough for all to understand and apply. Hi, thank you, thank you. And we have some questions too. Thank you, I'm very interested in getting my son's services. Thank you, please, if possible, I will drop my email hoping to get more information. Thank you. And, uh, and same parent, uh, yes, I think, the, I think you're right. I think I may need some counseling myself. We understand and, and that's not, that's completely valid. Uh, thank you for- you Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say thank you for reading that out loud because I was no noticing that some parents are interested um, in in services. So yeah, so CCMH, I'm taking note of the email here, but I'm sure JC will also share our information with um, you all. We offer counseling services virtually. 
for children and youth that are currently living in the Bronx, go to school in the Bronx. Um, but if you know, you're know you a parent and um, you want to find resources, while we do not offer individual therapy to parents, we do offer consultations where we'll sit and we'll work with you to help you find the resources that may be available. And then there are also times that parents um, want to refer their children to us and we find that perhaps additional resources are necessary um, or maybe, um, yeah, different resources than what CCMH may be able to offer in the 10 counseling sessions, for example. And we also work to provide you that information as well. We're not just going to say, nope, we can't help, bye. Um, we'll really work with you. So we encourage you to, um, to be with us. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, if there are any other questions, please ask them now. Otherwise, we, um, I'm gonna go ahead and activate a poll, but uh, we do have a comment. Uh, Congratulations, many congratulations and uh, thanks and blessings. And I would like to attend the program. Um, yes, muchísimas gracias, uh, señora María. Agradecemos su comentario. Este, por favor, si quiere, se puede comunicar conmigo. Um, yes, if you need to get in touch with us, uh, please, uh, it'll be the inf contact information will be in the follow-up email I will send today or tomorrow. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much. If you feel like you need any of our services, I'll place any of that, uh, some information on that in the comment section as well. You're welcome to participate in our intake. I do want to let you know that we are in preparation of a couple of announcements actually for this week. Let me pull up the calendar really quick. Um, for this week, we will have bilingual, we will start our series with the Department of Education over specialized education programs uh, in the special education department. Um, this week, we will be focusing every Thursday for the month of December, with the exception of the week before Christmas, uh, we will be highlighting uh, and discussing directly with the directors of special education and these specific departments. Um, so Thursday will be bilingual special education and what that is. Uh, dual language programs and all of that but with a focus on special education next thursday will be the aces program aces program uh the following thursday will be the autism spectrum disorder uh nest and horizon programs and then the week of christmas will be the aims program aims uh, also next week we will have on tuesday our workshop over guardianship and alternatives as well um <clears throat> And then the following Tuesday, oh, excuse me. And then the week of Christmas, we'll be having Turning Five. Um, and then we are also doing a special presentation with the Albert Einstein College of Medicine um, and Montefiore Partners um, and the New York State Developmental, Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. Sorry, it's a long acronym. Um, we will end the Department of Education and we will be presenting over the vaccine and COVID, everything you need to know about COVID and the vaccine in schools here in New York City. Um, so yes, those will all be coming up for the month of December. It's gonna be a busy month. You'll see a lot of me if you attend, um, but uh, hopefully, I hope to see you there. Thank you so much, ladies. This has been so great. It's so good to have you back and I hope to have you back soon again uh, on more important topics around mental well-being and, and mental wellness. So thank you. I'll go ahead and activate the poll now. If there are any questions, please feel free. I'll stick around. Ladies, feel, uh, feel free. I'll follow up with you for sure, but we really appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye, Maria Sol.